Hi guys, welcome to lesson 2.2 on soil ecology and the soil food web. Today we'll concentrate on the soil food web and what it means, and it involves the different trophic levels of feeding levels of organisms on one another. We'll also talk about how these organism groups are divided, so the biota divisions within the trophic levels, based on the trophic levels, their size, and how they fit into the soil food web context. Okay, so let's jump into lesson 2.2. So basically, we're going to talk about the concept of ecology, but we'll go into it deeper. We'll go into how this interaction occurs between the plant and the associated microbes and then the associated different organisms that feed on the microbes and so on in order to introduce really how intertwined and interconnected the soil food web system really is. And then we'll look at how can we get these organisms out there into the soil ecosystem. So this is the soil food web diagram and basically we would focus on the biota communities and their assemblages, how they assembled these different communities of organisms, the different levels of biodiversity within the system. And this actually spans across different disciplines in biology and ecology. So it applies to conservation biology, community ecology, and ecosystem services. So these are different sciences being studied, yet this applies across them. So really, they need to be really integrated in order for the system to be understood on all levels of human endeavors in studying ecosystems and soils. The system is powered by the sun and carbon dioxide, and this, of course, yields oxygen being released into the atmosphere as well. So we've got this plant interaction as the first hand. The primary producer is the plant doing its job through photosynthesis, and then that carbon being liquidized sweetens the soil, so to speak, by the root system actually releasing those carbon molecules through to the fungal partners normally, first of all, that are on the roots and then feeding the other microbes that are around the system. The other form of energy is the soil organic matter, which we've spoken about extensively by now, is how the organic matter is produced through this drop effect of debris from the plant and how that enters the soil and becomes food through the microbial degradation, actually feeding the microbes. And there's, of course, different functions of the different biota groups from the second trophic level, the bacteria feeding on the plant debris and the plant sugars, all the way to bigger organisms like earthworms, but even mammals as well. We'll look at the fauna interactions and the impact it has on nutrient cycles and how plant selection and biodiversity occurs through this interactive network of organisms modifying the soil ecosystem. So we've got the plant doing its photosynthesis, dropping its organic matter, and then here in the second trophic level, bacteria and fungi are the first organisms that are going to access these two organic matter components. And in order for the huge amounts of minerals to be released from these bacteria and the fungi that are gaining minerals for the plant in exchange for that liquid carbon coming down from the plant and the organic matter, when these organisms are actually fed upon by protozoa and nematodes, so the third trophic level, the protozoa, these are unicellular microscopic animals. You can think of the amoeba as being one of those. And then the nematodes are multicellular organisms, but still microscopic and very much the feeders of fungi and bacteria. So there's different groups, specifically bacterial feeders or specifically fungal feeders. And these organisms, when they actually consume the bacteria and the fungi, they release the plant available nutrients that the plant requires from these bacteria and the fungi. So really, without the predators of these, we really don't have much chance of our plant gaining any food. But once these two different groups of organisms kick in as the primary consumers of these bacteria and fungi, the plant can then receive nutrients. And of course, as the protozoa and the nematodes are themselves consumed by larger nematodes that are predatory or larvae of different insects, all these cute little tiny, still sometimes microscopic arthropods, so legged organisms that are often shredders as well, that actually shred down the organic matter because they're feeding on the microbes, eating the organic matter. They're also particulating or making small other organic matter. But at the same time, as they release their excess nutrients from nematodes, 
and the amoeba that they feed on, they will give plants nutrients immediately as well in that same manner. So all of that food basically feeds into the plants. And of course, plant roots are exploring and so are the fungal partners on the plant roots exploring for these nutrients, these poos that they make as they feed. So this is basically how it keeps going. And then it goes all the way above ground where animals feed on the soil food web system and a part of the larger food web, the above ground food web. So all of those food webs sort of interconnect below ground, above ground, and then in the canopy. So it's very much all connected, interconnected, but we're talking about the very bottom layer of that happening from the plant, from the sun, from the atmosphere, into the soil and into this beautiful system that we call the soil food web. So just to give you a more, I suppose, microscopic understanding and then zooming out into the bigger picture again, I love this image here from the State of Knowledge of Soil Biodiversity. I highly recommend this reference to be read. It's wonderful and you'll learn a lot from it. So when you look at it from this perspective where there's a root cell and this is the cell wall and there's a root hair and so this is like a cross-section of a plant cell, all these tiny little creatures are around it, of course, and just to show you the differences in sizes, so how little bacteria are compared to the giant cell of a plant, of a root, and these little organisms are there by the root cell and doing their exchange of nutrients, usually at this level here, as the protozoa and other organisms like the nematodes are feeding on these bacteria. But the amoebae and the ciliates and other protozoa organisms are feeding them. It shows the virus as sort of like a scale to show you how minute these things are. And also the bigger fungal cells going through as they contribute to this whole. And there's also actinobacteria, so filamentous bacteria that are part of the system as well. Just to show you a sort of a more scaled image of it so you can imagine what it might look like in reality. And this state of knowledge of soil biodiversity also has this diagram of the soil food we're portrayed in a different kind of way through divisions of these biota. You can't really see this, but we've got the microorganisms here, so fungi and bacteria. We've got the microfauna, which is the protozoa and nematodes, and we've got the mesofauna, which is the level up. So each of these consecutive levels feeds from the bottom up, and so the mesofauna are feeding on the microfauna, and the mesofauna are very microscopic sometimes, but also sometimes visible things like mites and tiny springtails and things like that. And then the macrofauna. So macro just means that we can actually see it. So things you can see with your naked eye, like millipedes and ants and beetles and beetle larvae and things like that. So obviously they feed on the mesofauna. And so when we look at it from a perspective of, of the soil organic matter here and the bacteria and fungi feeding on it, we can see that the bacteria are feeding the protozoa. Predatory nematodes feed on the protozoa and the bacteria as well. That's the bacterial nematodes here. And that's feeding the predatory microarthropods. And the fungal feeding nematodes are also feeding the predatory microarthropods. And then it just goes up scale. So the arthropods then feed on the predatory microarthropods. And these are already going across these two mesofauna, macrofauna. So we're trying to look at it from a perspective of size, but it's really difficult because there's all these crossovers. So it's just a very loose way of looking at it, really. And of course, these organisms then, saprophagus, meso, and macroarthropods, just means they're eating the organic matter. Saprophagus means they feed or shred the organic matter as they're trying to get the microorganisms off. And some of them will actually have organisms in their guts to actually decompose that organic matter that they shred and consume. And these are saprophagus microarthropods as well, as well as meso and macroarthropods. And of course, this transforms the litter. And so that litter is being transformed through the system as well. And of course, the plant was feeding the original bacteria and the fungi and the organic matter does that as well. And then we've got the ecosystem engineers, which are macroarthropods as well, but earthworms and termites and ants. And the reason why the ecosystems engineers is because they change everything so much by making these tunnels and structures underground. So they literally engineer the ecosystem and they provide so much water movement and air movement and biota movement and they really like engineer it by making it all very intimate and interactive they create the space for everything else that's smaller than them to function in so let's first of all look at those microbes and the microfauna that feeds on them 
if you look at the state of knowledge of soil biodiversity, they'll put everything into a size-based organization. So between 20 nanometers and 10 micrometers, you've got the microbes. Bacteria and archaea are very related, but they're the tiniest things besides viruses, which oftentimes scientists don't even call them life forms <laughs> because they're a bit of protein around a DNA molecule. So basically, these little guys are the tiniest things. They're the ones that will degrade the rock and the organic matter and get the sugars from the plant. So they weather the minerals, they decompose the soil organic matter. And then they're, they're eaten by the larger, a little bit larger organisms that can fit them into their mouths. And they, the, the microfauna is a little bit bigger than the microbes, obviously, because it's got to eat the microbes. And that's between 10 micrometers and 0.1 millimeter. And the more biodiversity we have with each of these groups, that allows for more biodiversity further up the food web. And of course, as the microfauna feeds on the microbes, it releases their nutrients it allows those nutrients to be pooed out into the soil ecosystem and the roots will absorb that poo directly. And so what we have here is now this requirement for water to be present because these organisms only live in water bodies. They're literally aquatic. And so this gravitational water happens as capillary action takes water further down the soil profile. There's also this capillary water that when water molecules stick together and the water actually spreads across and pulls itself across particular matrices, in this case soil obviously. And there's also hygroscopic water which is absorbed directly from the air. So that water is available there for those organisms to pass through, to work their magic, to be able to feed. They really literally require moisture for survival and they go dormant if water isn't present. And here I've just stuck together all the different images of all the organisms and the bacteria are the smallest just here in the background and sometimes they're clay particles as well. So the bacteria are the round little balls and rods that are in the background, the fungi are here and then the protozoa that feed on bacteria and then we have of course the nematodes as well and a predatory nematode that feeds on a bacterial feeding nematode which is here. Once again the fungi and the bacteria in the background which will go into, obviously, each of these groups, like the protozoa and the bacteria, and in their own right, they'll have their own lessons. And that's a little microarthropod, which we'll talk about next. But within that system, also, we have organisms that are a little bit larger, and they're also multicellular now. They're a little bit bigger organisms, like 0.05 millimetres to just above a millimetre. They're the microfauna. So they're still in that group of really feeding on bacteria and fungi and each other sometimes just depending on the size but we've got nematodes so multicellular organisms rotifers super exciting beautiful creatures very interesting i've got some videos that would blow you away that i'll put up on youtube one day so you can have a look so many videos of all these beautiful creatures and when i found my first moss piglet or tardigrade or also called water bear I was screaming with joy. It was absolute delight. These gorgeous little creatures that have little legs. You can see with their little claws, they can survive extremes in temperature, extremes in gravity. And it's just incredible in ice and places like that. But these tardigrades are just the cutest because, I mean, they're the first sort of organism that you can look at down the microscope and go, yep, that is an animal. They don't really see, but they've got light detecting sort of eye cells you can see there on their face they're very cute so they're that personable little creature that you can start saying is adorable and cute even though i think all of them are super cute and adorable but these are just groups that these organisms fit into and so this is like once again the division between microfauna and mesofauna and mesofauna is basically these sort of bigger creatures that i've never even heard names of like proturans and poropods or parapods so once again, they're a little bit bigger. And mites, of course, that's a term we're familiar with. But these are all these creatures that live in the soil and do their magic. They eat these guys normally. The, you know, the mesofauna will oftentimes eat the microfauna and also the microbes. There's all kinds of things like potworms, for example. These are tiny little worms that you can sometimes see living under your pot plant. Insect larvae and isopods. But these are all the tiny little creatures, or even springtails and silverfish. But springtails are a whole group of 
marvelousness to their own. And here they are, Columbula, which is springtails. And I really, really, really recommend going to Andy Murray's Chaos of Delight. These are his images. If you type into Google Chaos of Delight, and I'm sure I've added a link to his webpage in the references, you will be delighted to see this. It's an absolute pleasure to look at the different springtails that are there. They're a very ancient form of organisms. Hardly anyone studies them. They're absolutely gorgeous. And he goes around the world and searches for these amazing creatures. This one really reminds me of a rabbit for some reason. It's so cute. And look, it's got tiny little mites feeding off of it here <laughs> as well. But they're basically invertebrates. They've got no backbone and they've got an exoskeleton. That's what an invertebrate means. So we've got 0.1 to 2 millimetres, and in temperate soil, there could be 1,000 per gram of soil and up to 200 species in just gram of soil of all these different organisms, not just springtails but other microarthropods as well. I just want to explain what microarthropods are, or rather what arthropods are. So arthropods are those animals that make up the largest phylum of animals on Earth, and it's called arthropoda. These include insects, millipedes, anything with an exoskeleton, like a harder shell on their body that is actually also segmented. So they've got segmented bodies. And also their little legs are also segmented as well. So that's all that means. Microarthropods are just microscopic arthropods. And arthropods are animals that belong in the phylum Arthropoda. Okay, so that's it for the arthropods. Now the macrofauna meaning being more visible now to our eyes, are the ecosystem engineers. So I want to talk about a couple of these groups, and that's the earthworms. They're about 2 to 20 millimetres. That's the sort of division that the macrofauna fits into. But, of course, we know that earthworms can be way larger than 20 millimetres. But they start at that size when they're babies. So this macrofauna, once again, there's a blurred line between the megafauna of the soil and the macrofauna. <laughs> So the macrofauna is like wood lice, worms, ants and termites and they transform litter because they're shredding things as they're trying to get nutrients from the fungi and bacteria feeding on the litter itself. So we could call them detritivores because they actually consume the microbes that are eating the detritus and a lot of them will graze on the mycorrhizal fungi which are the symbiotic fungi on the roots of plants. And they really, by doing this, they basically transform the minerals, so they accelerate mineralization of nutrients. They transform the nutrients, making them more available to the plant for consumption, for plant consumption. So they could be divided into predators, plant herbivores, and also they move through soil. So like ants, for example, could be predatory, but as they build their structures underground, they make galleries under the ground, so they bring this organic matter down whether it's an animal they predate or whether they're herbivore and like leaf cutter and take plants down. And they really increase water movement through soil and water availability and aeration, and they form new habitats for smaller organisms to move in. Their feces have all kinds of amazing microbial diversity, and when we talk about earthworms specifically, you'll see how much richer the microbiome is in the soil because it's got the gut microbiome of the earthworm which is specific as well and that adds that biodiversity into the soil ecosystem. Then they basically their feces create activity hotspots where microbes are not only richer in diversity but also they can thrive there because all these transformed minerals are now present for the microbes to function and as well to feed from. And they cast create soil structure and nutrients make nutrients way more available than if the worms are not present. And if we have a situation where we're stubble, organic matter is left and no tillage happens, so no soil disturbance, earthworms and burrows are created. So basically stubble and no tillage in agriculture means that we're actually inviting earthworms to form their burrows and to have a habitat in our soil. In long-term studies of subtropical grain experiments, and this is five months post crop production, this specific worm that resides in those soils is increased in number by six times and 21 times greater biomass of this earthworm occurs in the soils where there hasn't been tillage and the stubble was retained versus when there's tillage and burning. If we till, we'll kill the earthworms, we will slash them, they'll move away, their burrows are destroyed so they can no longer live there. So obviously studies are showing that if we change our practices, 
and we go into conservation agriculture, we don't disturb as much, we don't poison, we don't remove these organisms, they're part of the ecosystem and we utilise them for crop production. So no-till and stubble in subtropical soils creates these deep burrows of different species of earthworms and around 500 tonnes of cast per hectare are created on the soil surface in two years in these systems increasing nitrogen by 62%, phosphorus by 29 and carbon by 27%. So obviously, lots of food is provided through these creatures for our plants, which is a wonderful service that they provide. Now, termites and ants are very similar in that they are also ecosystem engineers, but they very much persist in drier, hotter regions, in dryland agriculture and arid climates. And what happens is because a fungi, for example, function really well above ground when there's moisture, but termites actually feed fungi underground. That's how they get their food digested and then they eat the fungi. So they create underground systems where there's obviously more moisture and fungal cultivation can happen there. So oftentimes there will be specific termite groups that have specific fungal symbiosis and they grow fungi gardens and the nutrients, the fungi transform, the termites feed on, but also plant roots get a lot out of that as well. And it's basically taking organic matter underground and creating the ecosystem rather than chop and drop methods where there's a slow degradation above ground because fungi can't withstand dry conditions. It's all happening underground and the termites and the worms and other creatures take it down. So very interesting how the ecosystem functions differently in different climates. In long-term sorghum and wheat fields, a semi-arid central Queensland experiments, they showed that four species of subterranean termites in no-till were present. So in a no-till soil, under sorghum cultivation, these guys existed in abundance and none were present because their galleries would have been completely destroyed where cultivation happened of the soil. So once again, these galleries can stretch. The minimal size of them is 50 centimetres below ground and there are really way more of these structures created by the termites, obviously, in no-till soils. So 70% reduced tillage only has 25% of that versus tillage, which is none. So once again, just to show you this comparison, what happens when termites are present and are allowed to be present through the management practices of the soil? And then we've got stubble that's left over as well and not taken out or burnt, and that feeds the termites in no-till systems and leads to rapid nutrient release. In northeast Western Australian wheat farms, ants and termites increase yields by 36% via water infiltration, nitrogen mineralization. So that's just to show you once again that there's huge benefits for us to have in these systems when we allow them to be present and function properly. And of course, then there's the megafauna, which is over 20 millimeters in size. Things like <laughs> this beautiful creature here, the wombat, where they make burrows. Sometimes it's not as elaborate as living in the burrow. For example, the bandicoots will dig a hole. They're still doing this job where they're creating spatial heterogeneity on the soil surface and in the profile because they move through it. So even though some of these organisms don't exactly move through the soil, they do dig holes. And when they do that, they actually moving the microbes around. There'll also be water infiltration into these holes that they create. There's all this potential now where there's extra level of complexity added to the ecosystem. So we've come to the end of lesson 2.2. And in our next lesson, we'll look at the concept of conservation agriculture and give some examples of how this type of agriculture that focuses on ecosystem services and providing the conditions for biological systems to thrive in the soil, how that actually impacts production. How beneficial is that and how much better is it to have these ecosystem services provided by organisms within the soil versus when we actually treat the soil with chemicals and exploit the soil instead of also trying to conserve and understand the importance of the organisms as a vital part of the agricultural ecosystem. We'll also look at how to cultivate microbial populations and the soil food web organisms, and how can we add the soil food web organisms back into the soil. Okay, you'll be hearing from me in lesson 2.3. Bye for now.